with you today for today's world webinar. Um, our, a special acknowledgement goes to Daji uh, for giving us free reign for the topic. I'd like to also have a, a, give a special thanks to Snell and the technical team, Abhi, uh, Prajesh, uh, for hosting this webinar from three different countries, France, India, and Australia. My name is Dr. Parish Ramji from Australia. I'm a psychiatrist and I've been practicing in the New South Wales re region of Australia for the last 10 years. I'm here today to talk about the interconnection between neurosciences and spirituality in the context of achieving wellness during present times. I'm hopeful that after my presentation, you will be able to have a better understanding of a deeper connection of these paradigms. Through my medical career, I was taught that results of treatment were based on evidence-based research and science teaches us that the universe is ever expanding. Likewise, our consciousness in the spiritual sense can also expand. I'm in a fortunate position to explain these aspects from experience, not only as a specialist psychiatrist, but also as a heartfulness practitioner. I'm going to talk to you briefly of the current unprecedented crisis the world is experiencing. And this will give us, it will offer us a glimpse of a deeper understanding of the link of neurosciences and the spiritual aspects of meditation to, prove, to improve our wellness. The coronal pandemic is pushing the world into a mental health crisis. And from this slide, you could see that psychiatrists are fearing a tsunami of mental illness after lockdown. And this is happening throughout the world. In Australia, we have recently been affected by devastating fires and now the pandemic. The fires have killed people, destroyed homes, uprooted families, destroyed lands, animals, and damaged our sensitive ecosystem. And about this pandemic, besides the loss of lives, it has also affected people. How are children and adults and the elderly populations are getting the support they need? School closures, lockdowns, self-isolations, fears of hospitals, panic buying, hoarding, gaming, gambling, addiction, and aggressive advertising are some of the issues facing the general population. And I see this as a psychiatrist in my practice, and we see many patients having these disorders suffering from anxiety, as well as depression and post-traumatic stress disorder. And nearly half of the population in some countries report that as a result of the coronavirus, crisis is harming their mental health. Online therapy and emergency crisis centers report about the 65% rise of the clients seeking mental health support services. Recently in China at one of the hospitals, it was found that half amount of the population of health practitioners, including doctors and nurses, are suffering from depression and 45% from anxiety and insomnia. And generally clients are phoning it because of concerns dominated by coronavirus anxiety and feeling suicidal. And as you see from this snip that I've put on the slide, it's becoming, uh, it's becoming unprecedented and uncontrollable. And the key concerns that most mental health professionals and emergency physicians and health services are having is that there's limited fun funding by government towards mental health, community behavioral support centers, and they are unable to complete or run their programs. We're fortunate in Australia which is one of the first countries that announced $48.1 million funding for national mental health and well-being being, and towards the pandemic response. Our government have also appointed a chief mental health officer to plan mental health responses to this virus. And if, besides increasing testing for this virus, we are doing more mental health screenings in, in our country. There are also concerns with certain adversary groups because they feel that the economy is going to be further harmed by the mental health disabilities. 
there's a shortage of mental health workers to deal with this crisis. And using the estimates from the Men Men Meadows Mental Health Policy Institute, which is called MMHPI, they say that unemployment will rise by, if it rises by 5%, about 4,000 people are going to be dying by suicide. And another 4,800 by overdose deaths. If unemployment rises to the levels of one in the 1930s, as what we see in the Great Depression, to about 20%, we're going to see 18,000 people dying by suicide and overdose deaths, which will rise to about 22,000. So intervention is needed in different ways um, to manage. In terms of buying, they're having access to guns and buying a lot of guns in order to protect themselves. And this is limited, we need to limit the access to guns because this is just going to increase suicidality. We need to screen patients for mental health and treating underlying mental health conditions to ensure access to therapy, the crisis lines, and other services. So, one of the clients described this pandemic as the COVID virus. It chips away your soul and you need to hold on the positives. In an essence, this may be true because there's a strong correlation between the impact of stress on the neurocircuitry. And from the slide, you could see that when there's stress, we find that there's a disturbance in the chemical pathway that leads to a disturbance in serotonin and noradrenaline. And these neurotransmitters, in layman terms, are important chemicals to restore stability of the mind. And this is very important for anxiety, post-traumatic stress, and depression. In, in the spiritual sense, our conscious state of existence, which we call action, and the knowledge that we gain from any experiences, we have to utilize this in order to find a way forward towards our own happiness. And that's a spiritual sense that this is interpreted as for action, it's called karma, gaina, and ananda. As is the conscious state, the characteristics are different and, and separate in peculiarity and intensity. The existence comprises of various forms of conditions in which different elements appear. And from the spiritual explanation, the two aspects of action and knowledge are conjoined in the middle link which is to the heart. And to explain this in the simplified, I wish to present a few slides for better understanding of this connection. We are aware that science proves by verification. And spirituality proves by the immediate presence of self and true meditation experience. So in slide three and four, which I'd like to just talk about a little bit, I've talked about the limbic systems from the neuroscience pathway. And in the, in, in the, in the fourth slide, it also shows that there's other pathways that can affect depression and anxiety. And we see that there's a neurochemistry change in terms of um, changes within the circadian rhythm, and that's called the sleep cycle. So if the sleep cycle is disturbed, that can also upset the neurochemistry and the levels of noradrenaline, serotonin, and dopamine that can also lead to depression. Then we have also other genes, and just some patients may have predisposed genetic factors that has abnormal clock genes based on the fact that they've been anxious because they could be carrying a genetic predisposition to anxiety or depression, that could be of a familiar onset from either of the parents or from the grandparents. And then there's the environmental factors that we could see that also plays a role in terms of on this, what happens to, uh, to the pathway that can also affect. So the environment factors in the pandemic we're seeing is that this is leading to panic buying, the fear of getting the virus. So it's also affecting your social rhythm and your sleep cycle. So it's a vicious cycle. If your sleep cycle is disturbed, 
it disturbs the chemistry in the brain. And then we have also other personality changes that we see in people. They become more depressed, they become isolated, withdrawn, and they become more anxious. So this, this is the neuroscience exp, ex, uh, explanation of what's happening to the brain. And I, my presentation is able, is trying to link the two so that we have a better understanding between this connection and how can we improve this connection in our understanding of how these two paradigms are linked. Now, what is interesting is that in slide five that we see is that I've talked about the thought processes. So inside, inside five, what we see the next slide is that the brain is active all the time. So there's thousands of thoughts that's passing through the day. Some are related to norm, you know, to random activities and some are not related to random activities. So in cases in terms of what's happening in the pandemic, we find that anxiety increases to such an extent that you're preoccupied with this anxiety. And when you're preoccupied with the anxiety, it consumes you. So the mind is not rested. So what we find in the spiritual sense is that the mystery of all happiness lies in steadying the mind. And inside five, what we find is that it explains this in, in the spiritual sense. What is also interesting is that, you know, medicine is also involved towards spirituality. And a lot, some viewers may not realize this, that the art of mindfulness is a type of therapy that was introduced by John Zinn, who was called the father of mindfulness in the early, in, in the mid 1970s. He introduced the world to mindful based stress reduction to help people with pain, but it's been used now for depression and anxiety. So mindfulness is a process of awareness that involves in paying attention to the experience in the moment as opposed to be caught up in your thoughts. Diffusing thoughts to help you to not be consumed by the negative experience. And as a result of this negative experience, you're gonna become more anxious. So the art of mindfulness was also it's based on the heart of Buddhist practice. It's, a, it's also based on the universal realization which spreads knowledge or what they say in Sanskrit Dharma of non-attachment. Don't let your negative thoughts about suffering, nature of suffering and the nature of the human mind. And the scientific treatment can bring change, but it has its own limitations and treatment of adverse effects. So I'm going to be moving on to the next slide to explain the concept from the heartfulness perspective and how we're able to fine tune that inner con connection to, to improve your well-being. So from the heartfulness perspective, everything is based also from the ancient teachings of Patanjali, which uses the meditative approach of yoga sutras. And you could see there's various steps of yoga sutras, which I'm not going to be covering all the steps, but I'd like to focus on, on Pratyahara. That's the one step in slide eight, which means in Sanskrit, Pratyahara means prati and against, which means against and abad means intake. So in meditation, we try to turn away constant external stimulus to, to establish a different consciousness. And we become centered within by developing inner sense on a subtle level. And the heart becomes the center of meditation. And as we know from, from, you know, from, from biology that the heart is the pumping station and distributes blood to different nerves and cells of the body. In essence, the heart becomes the main artery to this inner con connection. And that's the difference in terms of spirituality. But how we do this is that we withdraw your senses from the object, just like a turtle withdrawing its limbs from all directions. So one is centered within. 
but to, to audit the process of heart rhythms can only be achieved by yogic transmission. And what is transmission? In the heart this way, it's a catalyst for profound meditation. So from a scientific point of view from neurosciences, we have to get the catalyst by using medication or therapy. Whereas in, in heartfulness, it's or any forms of meditation, we use different forms of catalysts. And but in, in heartful based meditation, it's based on transmission. It helps us to transcend the need to believe, it awakens a new reality, it helps us to expand your consciousness, and it helps us to evolve and its divinity in itself. So how are you able to do this? So just like mindfulness, when we talked about thought diffusion, is that getting rid of the negative thoughts and not forming that experience towards the negativity, but just being an observer. So for us, well, how are we able to achieve this is through a process of cleaning. So I'd like to show you a short clip about cleaning so to explain to you how we're able to diffuse these negative thoughts and not to attach these negative thoughts of this experience. So we're going to cleaning on the 10th slide. So I'm going to play this video just to understand how we do cleaning from a spiritual sense, which is also doing very similar to uh, what we do in, uh, in, in, in mindfulness, but it's at the deepest state of, of practice. Uh, are we able to, uh, as I've said earlier, uh, uh, help us to free a pattern of impressions in relationship to our thinking. So this also brings about the reconstruction of emotions of behavior in the positive way. So I'm not sure, Stan, are you able to play the video? Yeah. Cleaning is done in the evening after the end of a day's work. You or mentally cleaning complexities and impurities from your system. Sit comfortably, gently close your eyes and relax. Bring attention to your back, from top of the head down to the tailbone. Imagine all complexities and impurities are going out of the whole system in the form of smoke. The smoke is oozing up from the entire back. Do not dwell on specific events or things to get rid of. Simply brush them off. Gently accelerate the process with faith and confidence. Apply your will power as needed. Continue with the process for about 20 minutes. As the impressions leave, you will feel lighter and lighter, creating a vacuum in the heart. A sacred current from the divine source descends to your heart to fill the space. The sacred current is in you remove the impressions. When complexities and impurities are gone, you're feeling simple, you're feeling pure. The sacred current is entering every cell every corner of your body the whole body is feeling sacred your whole body is now completely purified and has become a temple of god 
All right. So cleaning is the second, as I've mentioned, it's a second core of practice. And if you look in terms, in terms of what's happening with the COVID virus, and I'm going to use that as an example all the time, that we become so distracted that it impacts on our lives. And most of the time we focusing on external awareness. And as a result of this awareness, it, it, in a way that it's affecting our senses, it's also impacting on our anxiety and it can create deep impressions and it consumes you, that you become so unwell. So cleaning is a very important core of the, of the practice. And it's exactly, we use it, as I've said, what, what you know, if you compare it, mindfulness is done from a psychological point of view in terms of treatment interventions in, in, in psychiatry or psychology, and uh, cleaning is done from a spiritual side, which is also a core part of the practice. I'd like to move on for better understanding of, of uh, understanding of how do we evolve in expanding our consciousness. And in order to do this is that it's again based on, I've talked earlier about your existence and existence is important of questioning yourself as to why you're here and how you're gonna make a difference at the conscious level, level in order to achieve uh, a change within yourself. So, so in the next slide um, shows you the existence of consciousness and bliss. And this is an important slide because uh, it helps you to understand the teachings uh, of, of, of heartfulness. And as I've mentioned earlier, that science teaches us that the human universe is ever expanding and research in, in medical science is also advancing. And in the same light, in the spiritual domain, our consciousness can expand. So the slide describes that our existence, knowledge and bliss, and in Vedic terms, it's called Sit, Chit and Ayanda, is tangible and it's also present at the physical level. So the gross body, its existence is through the sense organs. And as we've said that in order to, uh, it's proof in itself that, that the sense organs of sight, audition, smell, touch and taste exist with everyone. So if there is an abnormality in terms of your senses, obviously you're gonna be distracted and you're going to, you can be consumed by the senses and that, cause, that forms the gross body. The subtle body is the consciousness or your knowledge of how you're able to experience things at the deeper level. And the causal body, which is called Ananda, it's the inner body. And it is derived from Sanskrit root called nut, which means rejoice. And this, this stage is free from sorrow deficiency. So like the neurosciences, our main objective is to achieve stability of mind and achieve happiness. But in a spiritual sense, it goes much more deeper than just simple happiness. It's all about, we talk about the causal body, the inner body, which it's a, it's a state where to free ourselves from any sorrow deficiency, and it means total bliss or happiness. In the, the, the next slide, which I, it's also to simplify it, what I've talked about is written in a very simplified way between these three categories of, that I've indicated, just for your understanding. So have a look at the slide to understand what I've been talking about. So as one expands your consciousness, one evolves to other stages in meditation. Sit is the causal body. It's the upper region, which is associated uh, with sometimes with inertness, but we need action in order to bring about change. As one expands your consciousness, it involves other stages of Raj and Tim. And Raj in Sanskrit is the middle subtle body, which is a mixture of spirituality and body consciousness of the heart. So scientific in slide 12, scientific proof of, of the brain keeps some changes during med meditation. And you could see that what we, we, we see uh, 
you know, we have the knowledge of what we are, the contemplations of, of thinking that we have all the time. We see that uh, it, uh, it establishes the points of distinction. Then we have bookish knowledge. And one who understands the purpose of a deeper knowledge uh, goes into an experience at the deeper level, which is called the real sense of knowledge. So scientific proof, um, as, as you meditate, in, uh, I'd like to show you that the next slide shows you that neuroscience has also shown you that after meditation, there's changes within the brain. So don't rush to do other activities because when the mind settles, there's also changes within the brain after 10 minutes of meditation. And this is a very important distinction um, to, to rest the mind. So when your brain is active before, it, has, it also exposes a lot of your senses and, that's, and, and as a result of the exposure of senses, you can become easily distracted. In meditation, you're thinking of one thing all the time for the purpose of reaching a deeper level of consciousness. And after meditation, you can see the changes within your brain that it's, it's a lighter blue, so there's no activity. So don't rush to do other activities that speed up your mind. And I think this has also been mentioned with many uh, practitioners um, that it's important to reflect on that condition after meditation. So in conclusion, um, in light of the current pandemic and our wellness, I'd like viewers to take a few minutes of your time to self-reflect to deep introspection. Some may need to bring a change within ourselves to gain a better understanding of the catalysms of our planet. Does this change affect our carbon footprint or the natural ecosystem? And does our actions determine our fate? We have to come to realize over the last few months that nature does not need us. As mankind, we need to adapt quickly because we will always be dependent on nature to survive. We need to invest into our inner transformation sooner to be in tune with nature. The heart is the goal of human existence. It wakens us to a deeper wisdom and transform us from routine. So seek routine and you will find it. Thank you.